Welcome back everybody to another video lecture. Today we're going to be talking about the different types of bonds that covalent bonds can make such as polar and nonpolar. We're also going to be talking about intramolecular forces and those are the forces that are between uh, molecules. So I just want to point out that this is chapter 6 for my chemistry honor students and this material is in chapter 8 for my chemistry 1 students. So before we get into the chapter and talking about the bonds, we definitely need to review electronegativity. Remember that electronegativity was the ability of one atom to attract the electrons from another atom. So here on our periodic table, we as we move across the rows, electronegativity does increase. But I don't like this arrow over here. I really feel like this arrow should be pointing up because as we move up on the rows, we have high electronegativity. And the general trend is if we could draw across the periodic table, it would be the highest up here. So oxygen and fluorine are generally are considered our most electronegative, with fluorine being the absolute most electronegative element on the periodic table. So elements over here, we would say have low electronegativity. Elements, especially up here, no, not those um, noble gases, but over here, we would say have high electronegativity. So here's our formal definition of electronegativity again. It's a measure of the ability of an atom in a chemical compound to attract electrons. And atoms with higher electronegativity are going to be, as we said, are going to be oxygen and fluorine. Atoms with lower electronegativity are going to be like lithium, sodium, and notice these are generally going to form positive ions. These are going to form negative ions. And if we go back to our idea of the octet rule, if we look at fluorine, fluorine has seven valence electrons. Remember, it only needs one more electron to meet the octet rule. So this is why it has high electronegativity because it only needs one more. If we looked at sodium's Lewis dot structure, sodium only has one valence electron, so it's going to want to give that up. So it does not have high electronegativity because it's actually trying to get rid of its electron to obtain that noble gas configuration. In class, we're mostly going to discuss bonds as being either ionic or covalent. But we kind of do that for convenience sake. So what I need you to take away here, it says that most bonds are a blend of ionic and covalent characteristics. So what we're going to do is we're going to see that instead of just being ionic or covalent, bonds can be ionic, meaning where we are transferring that electron. We can have polar covalent where it's covalent, so we're still sharing electrons, but there's an uneven distribution of these electrons. And then finally, nonpolar covalent where they are sharing their bonds, or sorry, those electrons equally. So the way that we can determine the difference in electronegativity is actually if you look on the back of your periodic table, you can see that it lists the electronegativity for common elements, and so you would just compare the difference. So if I just did a little subtraction problem and I saw that my difference is 3.3, I know that the bond is going to be very ionic. If it's 1.7, it's going to be on the border of being ionic or polar covalent, and if it's at 0.3, it's going to be in between nonpolar and polar covalent. So a good rule of thumb, again, is that if your electronegativity difference is bigger than 1.7, you're going to have an ionic bond. If it's between 0.3 and 1.7, it's polar. And then if it's between 0 and 0.3, it's going to be nonpolar. And we're going to discuss on the next few slides what exactly polar and nonpolar means. A nonpolar covalent bond is where we have electrons are being shared equally. And these nonpolar covalent bonds usually form by identical atoms. So over here you can see the nucleus of one atom of another atom. And you can see this kind of blue shaded area here is kind of uh, the distribution or like where the electrons will be traveling. And you can see that they're sharing them equally. It's pretty a uh, pretty symmetrical picture here. And so again, this might be between like bromine and bromine. It might be between oxygen and oxygen. Again, notice that generally nonpolar covalent bonds form when you have the same element involved. Now, a polar covalent bond is where we have these electrons that are being shared unequally. And this results in a partial charge and is sometimes referred to as a dipole. So the first thing I want to point out here is this is, I believe, a delta sign, and it's positive. So this has a partial positive charge on this end. And again, here's our little symbol delta and a negative. So this means it's partially negative charge. And you can kind of see that our dumbbell is not of equal size. And remember, 
this blue shaded area is where the electrons are kind of hanging out or floating around. So you can see that the electrons are spending more of their time on this negative end because it's like a larger end. So it's more negative because there's more electrons and electrons have a negative charge. There's less electrons on this end. And so that's why it's more positive because there's less negatively charged particles on this end of the molecule. And so in our example here, a classic one here, this might be hydrogen and this might be chlorine. And when we looked at that picture of the periodic table before, um, hydrogen was on the left-hand side, so it has low electronegativity. Chlorine is found on the right-hand side of the periodic table, so it has high electronegativity. So it makes sense that it's going to be kind of pulling away those electrons more from hydrogen. This slide is a good review of the three types of bonds that we've been discussing so far. So nonpolar, you can see the path where the electrons are. It's equally distributed around the two atoms. Polar, there's an unequal distribution showing here that there's less electrons, more electrons, because this end is larger. And then ionic, you can see we have something small and something big, and that's because there was this actual transfer of electrons. And I believe we discussed this on the last slide. Here's just a review of what the values would be for each one of these types of bonds. Now a polar molecule does have this thing called a dipole. And this is a molecule with two differently charged ends with a positive and a negative. And polar molecules align themselves in an electric field. So just a second ago, we saw that where it was like the small dumbbell and then the larger dumbbell, and we said that maybe was like HCl or something like that. So this molecule, if I was to have a negative plate here, so you're seeing the negative charge and the positive plate, the way that it would arrange itself, because we have the, that rule of opposites attract, is this positive side is attracted to this negative plate, positive to the negative, positive to the negative. And then over here, our negative end of the molecule is going to be attracted to the positively charged plate. And you can see how the molecules orient themselves in this very specific way. And again, I just want to reiterate that this we have more electronegativity down on this end of the molecule, and so we would call this a dipole. On the last slide, I drew this little symbol down here, so we're going to go ahead and explain what the symbol means. So first off, a dipole movement the direction of the polar bond in the molecule. And for me, this really kind of means is where are most of the electrons spending their time. And so the arrow is going to point towards the more electronegative atom. And the reason that this is is because the more electronegative atom is going to have the electrons more around it. So here in our slide here, here's our symbol again. This end is going to be the positive, and this is in the negative. And for the, just the sake of consistency, let's say we're using hydrogen down here and chlorine down here. And the way that their dipole is going to look is something like this. Remember, there's less electrons spending their time down here, more down here. So that's why this end is much larger, because there's more electrons down here. And again, since there's more electrons, we're going to have a slightly negative charge. So here's just kind of how I draw the simple. Slightly negative, partial negative, partial positive charge. And so this is what's making our dipole. And again, I really like that this is pointing towards the more negative charged end. And then we put this little line here, which really looks like a positive symbol to me down here. So this is indicating that this is the more positive end of the molecule. So while electronegativity does play a large role in determining if a molecule is going to be polar, the shape of the molecule can also um, help determine if there's going to be some polarity in the bond. So here's a good example of a nonpolar molecule. So if you look here in the center, we can see boron, and then we have three fluorides. So it's going to be boron trifluoride. And so you might think by seeing these dipoles automatically, you'd say, oh, yeah, this is a polar molecule. But notice that the boron is being pulled, or we might say it's being symmetrically pulled, and so the dipole movements are going to cancel each other out. So I kind of feel like the boron's being stretched equally. So there's not like one part of the molecule where electrons are hanging out more than the other. So that's why we would describe this as being a nonpolar molecule, because the electrons are being distributed or shared equally throughout. Now here's a picture of water. And while we look at this water molecule shape, we might say, oh, it looks a lot like the boron trifluoride that we just looked at. So it must also be nonpolar. But in this case, we're missing that third one right here. So if we look at oxygen, it's really not being pulled equally. Because if we remember how we draw the Lewis dot structure, we would have those two lone pair electrons 
two sets of pairs of lone pair electrons at the top here. And so there's a lot more electrons hanging up here by oxygen than there are down here by the hydrogen. So here we can see our, our little symbol over here is saying that this end of the molecule is more positive and it's more negative as we move up. And this makes sense because there's way more electrons here up by the oxygen. So water is described as a polar molecule because there's an uneven distribution of electrons in the molecule. Now don't let the shape fool you here. What you sometimes need to do is look at how many electrons are going to be around each atom. So we know that there's generally two, oops, two electrons around hydrogen, but there's going to be eight electrons around each of these chlorines down here. And so what we find is that hydrogen has two, and so it has to share it with this carbon atom here. So that the dipole movement of this hydrogen carbon bond is moving more towards the carbons. Then from the carbons to the chlorines, well, the chlorines are much more electronegative, meaning that they're going to be pulling those electrons away from the carbon. So we can see these individual dipole movements are moving out. So the overall distribution of this molecule is at the top, it's very positive because there's very few electrons, and at the bottom, it's very negative because there's a lot more electrons at the bottom of this molecule. So we definitely say that this is a polar molecule. Here's another example of a molecule that's going to be also polar, but yet its shape initially might say it's not polar. So again, hydrogen only has the two electrons, and carbon is looking, it's much more electronegative, it's looking to have eight electrons surrounding it. So the electrons are going to be spending much more time around the carbon. So for both the hydrogens, the electrons are going to be moving towards the carbon. And then we have oxygen up here, and you can see, hopefully see these lone pairs of electrons here. So oxygen is really like we call it the electronegative hog. I've probably mentioned that in class. So even though carbon is pulling these electrons away from hydrogen, oxygen is going to be pulling these electrons away from carbon itself. So that's why this bond is this way. So the electrons are going to be spending much more time with oxygen than they are with the carbon down here. So the net dipole, and this should be a T at the end, dipole movement is in this upward direction. So we would definitely say this is a polar molecule. Here's another example of how the shape might deter you initially. So we can see that there are definitely some dipoles working here. Okay, see the dipoles? But what we have is an equal pulling or symmetrical pulling on the carbon, just like we saw with the boron trifluorides. And so we would say that this is a nonpolar molecule because the dipole movements are canceled out. So we're going to switch gears here for a second and just discuss metallic bonding. I believe this was the fourth section in chapter six. And so remember that in metallic bonding, we have electrons that can move freely because of overlapping of vacant or partially vacant SPD orbitals. And so we'd really describe this as a sea of electrons. So we have all these metal atoms together, we have a sea of electrons because there's all this overlapping electrons. And so the ability of electrons to move about freely accounts for the properties of metals. And so those properties might be that they're shiny, that they're good conductors of electricity, and that makes sense, good conductors of electrons, um, and that they're ductile and malleable, meaning that we can move them and shape them easily because their electrons can flow easily. They're not like in that specific crystalline shape in an ionic bond that can break easily. And now the last thing that I want to discuss on this video is this idea of intra molecular forces, and let me just spell it out, intramolecular forces, and this is the forces between different molecules. So we have hydrogen bonding, and this is when hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. I'm hoping that you're noticing that like these are really highly electronegative um, atoms. Um, so when hydrogen is bonded to one of these three atoms, there's a large difference in electronegativity and it creates a big dipole. And so remember that means that there's going to be a slight positive end and a slight negative end. And, but it's super strong because these are super electronegative um, atoms that hydrogen is hooking up with. The hydrogen atom becomes almost the charge of a full proton, and its small size allows it to get very close to an unshared pair of electrons. So this creates a large intermolecular force, which accounts for the high boiling points of water and ammonia. And I'm hoping that you remember back to your biology days, hydrogen bonding was really important in the role in DNA about those two strands zipping up, these kind of like rungs on the ladder. It kind of DNA zipped up because of this hydrogen bonding.
And then the last one that we're going to talk about on this video is this idea of London dispersion forces. So these are intermolecular forces that are created in atoms that contain many electrons. And the really cool thing about this is that this can occur in any type of atom, even noble gases, because those electrons are always moving around the atom. So if we think of the nucleus and then we think of the electrons, they're always moving, always moving. So if I have more electrons on this end of the atom or the molecule, this is going to be slightly positive over here, and this is going to be slightly negative because I have the more electrons over here. So there might be a time when there's more electrons um, on this end, and so this slight negative is going to be attracted to this slight positive, and this is what we call a London dispersion force. And so we're going to notice that these are the only intermolecular forces acting between noble gases and nonpolar molecules. Well, that's all I have for you guys tonight. Um, please make sure that you've written down any questions and then you ask them in class next time I see you. Good night.